Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Oakland Church. I welcome you. I'm Dave, lead pastor. So glad you're here. If you're a guest with us today, uh, love to get to know you a little better. We have uh, connect cards in the chairs, and this form is also available on our, on our website. We welcome our live stream audience. So glad you've tuned in today. And if you didn't pick up uh, either the notes page or the children's bulletin on your way in, you're welcome to get up and get those. They're in the corner. I think one of these days we're actually going to start passing them out again. Won't that be exciting? Hear yeah. these words from Psalm 30. I will exalt you, Lord, for you rescued me. You refused to let my enemies triumph over me. O oh, Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you restored my health. You brought me up from the grave, O Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. God, feeling a little joy today. Um, I hope everyone else is. If not, will you uh, replace the garment of heaviness for the the garment of joy, the spirit of joy. Um, lift our burdens today. Enable us to see you and, count, and encounter you and become more like your son. God bless each one who's here and, and those tuning in on the live stream. Um, just be glorified in our worship today. God, we commit this hour to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. And let's confess together. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remain standing as we worship. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You ready to worship? You ready to worship? Amen. All God's people say, praise the Lord. We praise you this morning. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. All I see is a mountain, you see the mountain move. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. Yes, you do. There's nothing to fear now.
again this morning. We give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you for all you've done. It's good to be in his house worshiping with you today and uh, sharing in the love of Jesus today. Let's do that together with our next song. Older than the ages, there is a promise of things yet to come. And there is one born for our salvation. It's Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a kingdom that forever reigns. There is a freedom from the chains that bind us. Sing his name. Jesus. Jesus. Who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me. He roars like the lion, and he bled as a lamb. He carries my healing in his hands. Jesus. name I call in times of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. It is Jesus, Jesus. And who walks on walking with us through the fire and giving us your everlasting and reckless love. Let's sing it together this morning. Before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word. You were singing over me And you have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in 
take a moment this morning and we just pause to remember where we were when I was your foe you still fought for me Lord you fought the battle to win my soul reached into the very depths and gates of hell to grab the keys of death itself and the parable says you leave the 99 sheep those that are in the fold 
to seek the one who's lost, Lord, that is how your love works. And I'm so grateful this morning, Lord, because I was that one. I was the one that needed your fresh touch and anointing. And God, sometimes that wears out. Sometimes I fall short, but your love still remains. Even though my feelings and my emotions, Lord, may fade away, you always stay the same. So help us to grow in you this morning as we come together and we offer words of prayer and praise to you uh, in these moments. We're going to gather as pastor leads us in a word uh, of prayer this morning to bring the needs of our congregation before the Lord. Uh, but we also allow space and time for you to come and kneel uh, at the altars this morning. If you have uh, some needs that you want to pray about uh, with each other, feel free to grab those around you and maybe join each other. Uh, or maybe just again to praise and assume a praise of humility or a posture of humility as we praise him this morning. Let's sing the chorus one more time, and you're welcome to come. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found on these and I do not. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you yourselves away Oh, the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of God You maybe see it? Oh God, keep chasing after us We who have trusted in Christ who bear the name Christian Sometimes uh, wander, Lord. And sometimes we're half-hearted, distracted. We chase after the wrong things. So keep chasing after us, Lord, until you capture every part. That's why we're here, oh God. And God, I thank you for hearing our prayers throughout the week, Lord, and and the needs that have been lifted before you on our prayer chain. God, we, we've seen your hand at work, Lord. You've brought us through. Thank you for touching Diana Reichenbach um, a week ago and then uh, seeing her through surgery. Lord, just heal her body. Thank you for being with Zach and Devin. God, I, I think they're doing much better and that you've protected their families from the virus. Lord, uh, keep healing them, God, and being with our people, Lord. Uh, we pray that we would take appropriate precautions and that you'd protect us, God, and that you'd enable our students to stay in school and that you'd bring an end to this plague. Lord, continue to be with Trudy. She deals with her hip injury. Just heal her body. Be with Tori, Lord. Just give him relief from the pain as he waits for the surgery, Lord. Uh, just restore health to, it, to him. Be with uh, clarity today and, and any who are homesick, God. Just go to where they are. Comfort those who mourn, Lord. Be with Mike as he grieves the passing of a family member and a friend. Continue to comfort Tom O'Donnell and Grant Trudy, Lord, and all who mourn. And we know there has been loss of life on the East Coast from hurricanes and down South, Lord. Um, just be near those who mourn and provide the assistance that's needed. And we pray for those who are suffering in Afghanistan, oh God. May they not be forgotten, Lord. Protect them and give them courage, God, and, and bring our citizens home, we pray. Be with the, the nationals, the Afghanis who face overwhelming challenges, Lord. As evil men have their day, God, just have mercy, God, and 
Help them to, the, them to endure. God, as we consider the problems of our world, ours become a bit smaller, but they're real to us, Lord, and you care about each need here, so hear our prayers, Lord, those who are kneeling and everyone who's calling out to you in these moments, God. We trust you with our lives and our problems. Just reassure us today and give us your peace and move mountains, Lord, if it will bring you glory. Help us so we can help others. But maybe it's in the helping of others that we ourselves are helped, God. May we see what we can offer to those who are hurting. God, we thank you again for this time to be together. And, and those who are tuning in, Lord, may they know that they matter and that you hear their prayers and that despite the distance, they're family, God. Um, and use this time to form us today. Open our ears and hearts to your truth. Sometimes it's hard to hear. Sometimes it requires response or change. But remind us that you love us and you're good and you have a plan, God. And we trust you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So did you go to pot this week? Hopefully you were here last week or that will be a disturbing statement. But we learned that um, going to pot isn't such a bad thing when we are trusting God with our lives to mold us and shape us. He is the potter, we are the clay. I have another idiom for you today. When in Rome. You know what that means? Do as the Romans. It's good counsel if you find yourself in a, a foreign uh, country or, or culture and you don't know which side of the road to drive on or how to greet people or what to order in restaurants. In those instances, it may be okay to copy the behaviors of those around you. But I fear that, that this attitude is what's getting us in trouble as the people of God and as the American church. Because I think the Bible's pretty clear. I just have a few scriptures as we start. Paul writes, says to the Romans, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Peter says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. That paints a picture, right? I mean, there's a battle going on for our souls, us against the world. And John writes, do not love this world, nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. But the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. 
And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. It's probably a mixed message because... Life is a great gift from God, and, and we've been given this beautiful world to enjoy, and we have a mission to be world changers, to interact with a world far from God and, and help them see there's a better way, bring light into the darkness. But there's that line there in the world, but not of it, thankful for the gift of life, but Realizing that the giver is way more important. Daniel is going to help us today dare to be different. Counsel us on how to live in this world without conforming to it. Um, so let's look at the book of Daniel as we continue our stroll through the Old Testament. Be reading the first chapter. Uh, the text will be on the screen, but if you have a Bible, it's helpful today because we're looking at like six chapters. So stand with me for the reading of the word. And as always, if you don't have a Bible, either here with you or own one, we have racks of Bibles in the back. You're welcome to. Jan Daniel chapter one, beginning with verse one. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, and Judah is the southern kingdom of Israel, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and per permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said, like you young guys here today. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning, are gifted with knowledge and good judgment, and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. They were, be, they were to be trained there for three years. And then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the, the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on, on a diet of vegetables and water, Daniel said. At the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared with the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine prepared for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him so much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any manner requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the musicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Man, yeah, that was a little long. I, I'm, not, I'm surprised more of you didn't start crying. All right, 
<laughs> it's a great story. I, I wanted you to hear it if you've never heard it before. But we've got to understand how tragic this, this is right now. The, the people of God, what was left of the nation of Israel, is now in exile. They're not quite slaves, but they're certainly not free to live as they please. And they've been taken from home and family and all that was familiar. And it was because they had conformed to the culture around them. They were uh, enamored by the foreign gods of the surrounding nations, and despite the warnings of the prophets, they began to adopt those pagan practices. And finally, God removed his, his hedge of protection and allowed Babylon to conquer them, to bring them into captivity. This was a form of God's discipline because he loved them. And it occurred to me that I doubt Daniel or Hananiah or Mishael or Azariah had worshipped foreign gods. I mean, we don't really know. But their parents had and, and their grandparents and, and sometimes that's all it takes for generations to suffer and pay the price. But why do we do that? Why do God's people get sucked into that trap of, you know, emulating the behaviors and customs of the, of the world around us? Well, it's obvious. <laughs> it's, it's pleasurable. It's fun. It feels good. It, it tastes good. The things of this world, you know, are, are good. I mean, they, they meet some of those needs, those desires within us. I don't know what was coming out of the king's kitchen. What I envision is like, have you ever been to a Fogo de Gallo, Brazilian steakhouse? They bring out these skewer after skewer after skewer of meat, and they just carve it off for you, you know. I don't know if they had fried food back then. They probably didn't have chocolate, but, you know, this was the best food money could buy. And if that doesn't sound good to you, it, it was at least better than broccoli, right? <laughs> no offense to vegetarians among us. Uh, when I go to Pizza Ranch, I always eat a big salad first. Then I don't feel guilty about, you know, what is to come. But uh, all they did was eat salad. And it couldn't have tasted as good. I mean, we're just being honest. The things of this world make you feel good. At least for a while. And we forget that. Like after visiting the buffet at Pizza Ranch, I, I'm not doing so well the next day. I have one confessional giggle in the front row. So. <laughs> Two, yeah. You going camping on weekends? That's fun. But we miss church. Watching movies late in the night and can't get out of bed and read our Bibles. I mean, it's, it's a trade-off that things in this world feel so good sometimes, but we miss out on God's best. And we're so wired, unfortunately, because of our sinful nature to do that which brings immediate gratification. So it's not surprising that we conform to the culture. It's pleasurable. It also positions us for success. Think of these four young men competing with maybe other foreign men or maybe the the, the young men of Babylonia for positions of power and prestige. And it, at this point, early on, I mean, most of us would decide if we want to play the game, we got to play by their rules. We got to fit in. And it usually works that way, right? Compromise works. I feel sorry for our kids today. 
so much pressure to get the grades so you can get into the colleges that it's hard not to cheat. And there are those temptations probably in every workplace to cut corners, to get further in your career. And it does seem to work that way, at least for a while. I think you always eventually get caught. Then we have a great story like this where doing the right thing was the best strategy, right? Living a life of integrity resulted in greater blessing from God and greater, greater favor from the king. God's way is pretty good. But it's, uh, it's easy to try to fit in so we can be more popular. Another reason it's easy to conform is, is self-preservation. It, it protects us from ridicule, from being left out of the club, being passed over for promotion. I don't know if we face physical harm, but some people do. Christians in Afghanistan, I, I get emails multiple times a week about what's happening in world areas where Christians are being asked to renounce their faith or, or be killed. That story is two chapters later when Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were forced to bow down to the king's statue or lose their lives. It was that simple. Either conform to the culture or die. In those moments, it's, it's not easy to do the right thing. I don't know if this warning helps. I mean, we do believe that there's a worse thing that can happen to us than physical harm, than physical death. Jesus says we don't have to fear people who can, you know, mess with us in this life. Because this life isn't all there is. But it's hard to remember that in those moments. Like If I just take the easy way out, if I just fit in, if I just laugh at the joke... I just cheat on the test. I can get, you know, I can survive, can escape some, some hardship. The last P was a late addition. Pathetic theology. It's what we believe. There's some who believes it doesn't matter what we do. So we talked in Sunday school some believe that, you know, we can't really do good, be good in this lifetime. Like, we're kind of locked into a life of sin. That's not what my Bible teaches, that, that, that we are called to put away childish things, to cease and desist those kind of behaviors that are displeasing to God and, and live a holy life. And we won't always get it right but Paul says, we have been bought with a with high price, the blood of Jesus, and, and we're to honor God with our bodies. It, it matters what we put into our bodies and what we do with our bodies. There is a real connection between that and our relationships with God and people. It's bad theology. It gets us in trouble. Makes it easy to conform to blend in with the world around us. Well, let me remind us about the, the high cost of copying the world. We, we learn. Well, I guess we didn't really see, but we think if it would have played out, we would have seen Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah become less healthy, less vibrant, less, you know, aloof. That's the wrong word. Physically, emotionally. I made the point earlier, I mean, this, in first service, that when, 
when we're living inconsistently, when we're not living up to what we know is right, it's, it creates dissonance. We, it's, it's hard to you know, sleep well at night when we've been compromising all day. The, the conscience bugs us. Relationships suffer. I believe when, when we lack integrity, when, when we cheat, when we do things to fit in, people we love are often harmed, and our relationship with God will suffer. Our health, all these areas, every area of our life suffers when we compromise. We also lose our influence. Because if we look like everyone else, there's no difference between us and the people who don't have faith, who don't claim to have been made new through Jesus Christ, then why would they want what we have? We are called to be light in the darkness. Don't hide it under a bushel. There's to be a difference between us and them. Maybe not the kind of difference that, you know, freaks people out, like you're just weird. Well, they probably will think we're weird by denying ourselves some temporal pleasures for the call of God on our lives. But I, I think at some point they, they're curious. They say, what's the deal? <laughs> You're not like everyone else. You, you don't join in our reindeer games. You, you know who you are. What's going on? We lose that when we blend in with everyone else. And the last thing that I think is affected by conforming, by compromising, is our future. God has a plan for our lives, and the enemy tries to derail us. He has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He, he doesn't want us to be used by God. If Daniel and his friends just fit in with everyone else, they would not have been successful. They would not have risen to the top. Maybe worse is beyond this life. Jesus reminds us, what, what, what does it benefit us if we are able to achieve and attain everything we dreamed of in this life but miss heaven? It's a high cost. When we try to blend in, when we conform to the pattern and values of this world, there's a better way. Daniel shows us a better plan for living in this world, but being who God has called us to be. We find his story, the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den in chapter 6. And I'm not going to read another whole chapter. So uh, for those who are not, are not familiar, let me, let me just summarize the new king on the throne, Darius, and he liked Daniel. He recognized Daniel's gifts and, and uh, promoted him to second in command over his whole empire, which caused the you know, third, fourth, and fifth in command to be threatened. They didn't like Daniel. They, they wanted to take him down, and they knew how they could do that. He was a man of faith. He believed in God. So they went to the king and came up with a suggestion. They said to the king, how about for the next 30 days, we don't allow anyone in the whole kingdom to pray to anyone but you. It seems odd, but, you know, kings tend to be a bit full of themselves. So he signed it into law for the next 30 days. Anyone who prayed to anyone but the king would be thrown into the lion's den. 30 days. All Daniel had to do was be a little discreet, 
to be covert in his faith, to close the doors of his house. But he didn't. He kept kneeling in prayer to the Lord, just like he'd always done with the windows of his windows of his house open, wasn't flaunting his religion, but he wasn't ashamed. He wasn't trying to hide. And that's all that his enemies needed. They caught him. They brought him before the king and they said, he broke the law. What are you going to do? And the king was reluctant. He, he loved Daniel, but he had to follow his own law. Threw him in the lion's den which generally didn't end well. One man, a bunch of hungry lions. The story ends this way. Very early, the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, he called out in anguish, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, Long live the king, my God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. And then the king threw his enemies in the lion's den. A little gruesome. They were torn apart before they even hit the floor, it says. And then the cool part, the king decreed that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he will endure forever. So the plan, be clear about who you really are. Everyone knew Daniel was a follower of the one true God. It's good to just go public in your school and in your job. I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm a Christian. It's my primary identity. I, I may be a, you know, a Hawkeye or a, an American or a king. That's my last name, in case you don't know. But I'm first and foremost a follower of Jesus. May give your enemy, you know, fodder to ridicule you, but at least it's out there. I mean, it's, it's good just to declare what's most important, to, to let the world know through your words, through your actions, through your t-shirts and bumper stickers, I belong to Jesus. I'm not ashamed of the good news about Christ. If we're trying so hard to keep it a secret, we are in trouble. We need to be clear. Secondly, be consistent. Be the same person between the Sundays. Everywhere you go. Our tendency is to compartmentalize. We, we adapt to our surroundings with our, you know, school friends or, you know, the, the guys or the girls. But God wants us to be integrated consistent. Much of that happens or comes from the habits we keep. Daniel prayed three times every day. Our habits of worship and prayer and, and Bible study help define who we are. Paul says to the Philippians, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens, whatever situation we find ourselves in, be consistent. Do the right thing. Honor God. Be courageous. A day will happen when it's going to cost us something. Again, Paul writes to the Philippians, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. It takes courage to follow Jesus. It can be lonely. <laughs> it 
sometimes feels like we're the only ones. I love uh, a few weeks ago when we talked about Elijah's story when he said, I'm the only one left who's following you, God. said, no, there, there, there are 7,000 others, you know. You're not alone. And we find strength in knowing that there are Christians all over the world who are paying the price for their faith in Jesus. God will give us courage to endure those, um, those moments of sacrifice and suffering if we trust him. And be confident. I love this verse from chapter 3 of, of Daniel when Hananiah, Michelle, and um, Azariah were thrown in the fiery furnace. They were confident that, that God would deliver them. They knew he had the power to see them through. He said, if we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, we will not bow down. I believe in a God who can protect us from harm, can um, thwart the plans of evil men. But sometimes they have their day. The wicked do have freedom to, to harm us and make our lives harder. But we know God will deliver us in the end. <laughs> Not in this life, in the next. We know that he is the rewarder of those who are faithful and who trust him. Faithfulness leads to blessing. The sacrifices we make for the cause of Christ do not go unnoticed nor unrewarded. Maybe even in this life, God will bless us. Jesus says to his followers that anyone who has given up house or wife or family for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life. I'm not sure that always happens. I mean, I, I've seen examples. I've experienced the blessing of God for being faithful, but it's the next life that's, that's promised, that's guaranteed. Those who suffer for Christ, those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, will be rewarded, will be blessed. And the last thing I want to help us see is that the blessing of the world, those around us, kind of rests on our faithfulness. They need us to be different. They need us to burn brightly for Jesus Christ. That's their only hope. If the church fails to be different, fails to be a credible witness to the truth of Jesus Christ, then they'll never see their need. Peter writes, be careful how you live, or be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable, honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. I wish that said they will trust Christ for salvation, that they will they will find their way back to God. I, I think that can happen when when we're faithful, when we take a stand for Jesus, I think others may see the truth. Their eyes may be open. Their hearts may be open. The sacrifice of martyrs, those who have paid the ultimate price for the faith in Jesus, has resulted in rapid expansion of the church, of the cause of Christ around the world. When we're faithful, people get saved. So let's resolve 
to follow Jesus, no matter what, no matter what the cost, no matter who joins us on this journey. It is the only path for an abundant life, a, a, a meaningful life here and now, and eternal life forever. Let's pray. God, it used to be easier to talk about this stuff because it wasn't so hard to be different, to take a stand, but it's getting harder, Lord. Our world, our society is becoming more and more hostile to people who believe Jesus is the only way. But that is the truth, God, and and Jesus is the only hope for our culture, our neighbors, our friends. So may they see him in us, God. We, we confess the times when the enemy wins those battles and, and we end up doing what other people are doing, saying what they say, laughing at things that are inappropriate, watching things that people think we should watch, God, and I don't think you're upset at us, but you deserve better from us. And you will enable us, God, to follow you. May we resolve to do so, God, no matter what. Give us the courage we need, God. Help us to look beyond immediate gratification. Help us to live for the greater reward because it is coming. You are the rewarder of those who earnestly seek you and live for you. So help us to make that decision and never turn back. In Jesus' name. have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, and the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back Will you decide now To follow Jesus Will you decide now To follow Jesus Will you decide now To follow Jesus no turning back, no turning back. So uh, I think, as, as Dave was sharing about the challenge to um, 
set ourselves apart from the world and, and live lives that are honoring of God and uh, just distinguishing ourselves from the world. I think our journey groups fit in really well with that mission. Um, so I want to give a little bit of a, a context behind, behind that and a little bit of a reminder of what they are. Um, so our journey groups are going to be starting October 3rd, and they're going to happen right after our service. Uh, we'll do a 930 service and then a 1045 uh, group discussion. And in those groups, we'll, we'll be discussing what happened in the service, um, whether that's the, the music, the sermon, the prayer, um, what did God do for you in the service. And Dave will provide us some uh, topics for, for discussion as well that kind of align with where we're headed. Um, and there's, in this context now today of where Dave was sharing about this distinction between uh, the world and, and how we should live, um, you know, I kind of think of the, the Romans 12, 2 verse that he shared, don't conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And kind of both of those are fitting in with that, that mission of our journey groups, um, kind of identifying first what, what challenged you, what is it about um, where you are in the world that, that needs challenge, that needs to be spoken to by, by what happened in our service today, and how can we live differently. And then be transformed by the renewing of your mind, um, you know, how can we take the word and live that during our week? Um, and th there's a, a book that uh, Dave used in a Bible study group that I was a part of uh, called Discipled by Jesus. And one of the questions that we asked every week was, um, does what you've heard or does your interpretation of that align with what we know about God? And we're, we're testing what we've heard as a group together, um, kind of sharing as a group under the leadership of, of one of our journey group leaders uh, to put that to the test, to say, as we go into our week, is what you're leaving here with something that aligns with what we believe about God and what we believe about ourselves as Christians? Um, and then really, the second purpose here is to help each other in that journey and to be uh, part of a group that's going to hold each other accountable to the growth that we share on Sunday morning. Um, in my job at work, I'm an Agile coach, which may not mean a lot to many of you, but we have a meeting every single day on all of our Agile teams uh, called the Daily Stand-Up, and every person on the team has to ask three questions, or answer three questions. Um, the first of those is, what did you do yesterday? What did you accomplish for the team? And to me, that's the question of kind of accountability. How are you doing with God? Where do you stand? Um, are, are things going well with you? Did you accomplish what you set out to accomplish? The second is, um, what will you be doing today? And to me, that's really where we start talking about the application of the, of the word from that morning in our journey groups. As we start to talk about, all right, you've heard this. Now, what's going to change this week? Um, that question really applies for me in our, in our journey group context. And then the third is, what are the impediments? What, what's keeping you from making that change? And I think, you know, Dave addressed that this morning with the kind of the first part of his sermon. There are challenges of position, of pleasure, of perhaps even bad theology that may keep us from practicing what we've heard that morning. And we want to tackle those in our journey groups. We want to get, get through what is it that's going to hold us back from really taking the word that we've heard and um, pushing ourselves forward into the week to grow in our love for God. Um, so I want to encourage you um, to join one of these journey groups as we kind of get information out about those over the next few weeks. Um, sign up, you know, be part of one of these, and we'll help each other grow in our love for God together. That's the purpose of these groups is journeying together um, toward greater love for God. Um, so, yeah, I hope to see you in one of those on October 3rd. Thanks, Gary. Gary Radens, board member, our media director. If, uh, if you like working techie stuff, he's always looking for some good recruits. A couple quick announcements, then we'll be done. We have our offering boxes around the outside and ways to give uh, online or mail a check. Encourage you to be faithful stewards of all God has entrusted to you. And we have a craft night coming up in a few weeks. We used to do these regularly, and I'm excited that... Uh, we're going to reboot these. Um, so 
I think you can sign up through our, our Facebook page. Why don't you stand and let me bless you as you go. So, so glad you're able to worship with us today. And I pray that this hour will make a difference in the week to come. So the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you and give you peace. You are dismissed.